Previously on Hebrew Roots. So we see, we see 1948 event, the event of the fig tree, yes. ushering in the Christ appearing. Yes. Ushering exactly. in, being a sign of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And now, that is how come he's coming. Remember, he gave three things. I spoke of the abomination of desolation that stands in the temple, yes. which speaks of the Antichrist. Yes. And then he also spoke of the sign of the coming of the Lord in the clouds, in the which speaks clouds. of the church. the church. And then he also spoke of the learning of the parable of the fig tree, which speaks of the political order of Israel. Israel. So now, there's going to happen the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. And then there's also going to happen the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds, which speaks of the church and the growth of the church. And there's also going to happen the parable of the fig tree, which is the political order of Israel. So we as a church should be looking at two things. We should be looking within us for the testimony of his coming within us, which would mature in his appearing. However, we should not close our eyes on the happenings in Israel, which is the fig tree, and the abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist, Antichrist. trying to take over the sacrificial system and the order of God in the nation of Israel. Israel. Yes. We have seen what law is, the framework of the law, the place of the Mosaic law and how it was done away with by it being fulfilled and completed by the Lord Jesus Christ in his saints. And then we see in the ushering of the a more superior law under the new covenant. Hallelujah. We have also taken time off to look at the covenants of the New Old Testament and how they have all been fulfilled in us as believers in these end times. Mm. Then we have looked at the parable of the fig tree as a political system exactly. in which Israel is the face, the, po the current political system the is bramble. the face of the bramble, that multinational and superpowers who are ruling the world currently and manipulating Israel. Yes. And we have seen that this is a sign to the church because it tells us the coming and appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ is at hand. Amen. Any social structure is best understood through its heritage and culture. Since the Bible was written from Hebrew traditions and antiquities, it should be considered from a Hebraic perspective. Unfortunately, many believers approach biblical Hebrew concepts with a Western mindset. This is why developing a Hebraic lens as we go through the scriptures cannot be downplayed. Welcome to Hebrew Roots with Pastor Obed or Ben Adai. Shalom lovely people of God. I'm excited to come your way with another edition of Hebrew Roots. As you can see, we are outside of our studios today and we are enjoying the cool breeze of nature. With me in the studios today is the anointed man of God, Pastor Obed, to help us delve into the issues of the Feast of the Lord. And I bet you, as you stay glued to your seat, you are going to get blessed by the teachings of this man of God. Pastor Obed, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd like you to talk to us about the feast. Yes, what are the various feasts and what do they stand for? Um, before I say anything, I'd like to extend greetings and say a very big shalom to all viewers who are here to listen and I pray that by the time we are through, the Lord will touch you and fresh understanding will come to you. Back to your question. Um, you were asking about what the feasts are. And then what they stand for. What they stand for. Principally in the book of Leviticus, the chapter 23, the word of God speaks concerning the feasts of the Lord. And right in that book, we see seven feasts. And the feasts actually are holy convocations. And the Hebrew interpretation for the word holy convocation simply means rehearsals. A rehearsal. Yes. So the so, feast means a rehearsal. Yes, the feast are actually God's rehearsals. Right. Now, and the Lord himself said it is his feast. They are not the feast of Israel. Are there particular reasons why he said they are his feast? Yes, they are his feast because they are the appointments of God. The word of God says that 
the feast are his appointments. And you see that one too also in Leviticus chapter 23, the verse number 4. And so right down from verse 2 of Leviticus 23, we realize that the feast of the Lord are actually his appointments, the Muadim in the Hebrew, and they are holy convocations. So God has appointments, and in those appointments, he has an agenda. So we realize that in the Old Testament, it was a shadow or a rehearsal of what actually was to come. For instance, um, people rehearse, let's take a, an orchestra, when they have to perform, before the actual performance, they will go for rehearsals. So in the Old Testament, we see that the Lord said, these are holy convocations, these are holy rehearsals. Now in the book of Colossians, the chapter 2, Paul comes on the scene and says that the feast and the festive seasons and the new moons, he speaks of them and he says that they are a shadow, but the substance is Christ. So that means... In the New Testament, we still celebrate feasts. In the New Testament, we have the substance. Right. In the Old Testament was the rehearsal. But in the New Testament, we come into the very substance, which is Christ. So when we speak of the feast, number one, we'll have to understand that the feasts are the feasts of the Lord. Yeah. And these feasts of the Lord in the Old Testament were rehearsed. And then Christ came, as we know, as I would expound also, to make the rehearsals an actual performance. That means, if I'm getting you right, Christ came to typify the feast. Christ actually was the antitype. He was the reality of the feast. Of the feast. He, he is the substance of the feast. So all that he did in the Old Testament was a rehearsal of what Christ was actually supposed to come and do. And do. All yes. Right. So we'll Christ is the performance. All right. And the Old Testament and all that it did was the rehearsals. All right. We'll come back to that. All right. But then let's go back to my question. Okay. What are the feasts? You, you, you spoke about seven feasts of the law. Yes. What are they? We have, to begin with, the Pesach. From the Pesach, then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Hamitsa. Now, then we move from the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All these names you are mentioning, are believers supposed to know and understand Yes, we are supposed to understand them. We are supposed to understand that there are seven feasts, the Feast of Passover, right. followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then from Unleavened Bread, we go to the Feast of First Fruits. Right. Then from First Fruits, we go to Pentecost. Then from Pentecost, we go to the Feast of Trumpets. Of when it comes to the issue of Pentecost. <laughs> All right. Yes, we'll now, so the um, fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets. Right. The sixth feast is the Feast of Atonement or the Day of Atonement. And then the seventh feast, which climaxes everything, is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, to quickly give you the Hebrew names for them, Passover is Pesach. Pesach. Then on living bread is Hamitzah. Right. Then we go to first fruits, which is the Feast of Bikurim. Then we go to Pentecost, which is Shavuot. Then we move on straight into the Feast of Trumpets, which is Yom Teruah. Then we go to um, the Feast of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur. And then we end up with Sukkot, which is Tabernacles. So now, these seven feasts are the Feast of the Lord. They actually mark the creative account or the creation account. Wow. Now, in the creation, we know that in Genesis chapter 1, the Word of God says, in the beginning. And when you look at the Hebrew rendition, in the beginning, it simply is Bereshit bara. That means in the beginning, God created. Bereshit bara Elohim. That means that in the beginning, God created. Now, the word in the beginning is the word Bereshit. Now, that word Bereshit is what is celebrated in the feast or in the month Tishri. And if you look at the word Tishri, which is T-I-S-H-R, E I, when you turn it around or you do a rearrangement, you have Reshit. Right. So now, Tishri and Reshit simply speak of the beginnings. So if you look so you at. So you mean the creation account is talking about the feast of the Lord? The creation account typifies the, the feast. feast. All, right. All that was happening in the Old Testament was a rehearsal. So now, the seven days of creation and rest, which is six days plus God's rest in the seventh day, all sum up to the various feast days. So every day of creation was a festive day of the Lord.
and then he climaxes it because actually every day of the creation god entered into a certain dimension of rest now marching up back to back the seven feasts of the lord they are not like i said the seven feasts of the jews or the seven feasts of israel they are the feast of the lord god himself laid claims and ownership to the feast they are his feast they are his celebrations they are his holy days so now in the feast we know that passover relates to light and the feast though are seven are principally seen to be three because in the word of god the, the, the bible says that god required that the nation of Israel should appear before him three times in a year. Now, they were not just supposed to come at will, but they were supposed to come in appointed seasons. And these appointed seasons were supposed to be the festival seasons. They appeared in the first feast, which was Passover. They came in the second appearance, which was Pentecost, and they came in the third appearance, which was Tabernacles. So aside the seven feasts, we have the three major ones. Yes, the three major ones are the three appearances before the Lord. In a year. In a year. The nation of Israel was supposed to appear before the Lord at Passover. Now appear before the Lord again at Pentecost and appear before the Lord again at Tabernacles. So we know that in the creation account, God principally did three things. He dealt with the light, dealt with the waters, and dealt with the earth. The first day, God said, let there be light. The second day, God parted the waters and created an expanse between the waters above and the waters beneath. And then the waters he called the seas. The third day, God declared that let the dry land appear. Now, as soon as we begin to understand the three patterns of God's creation, which is first the light, the, light. the second the waters, the waters, and then the third the earth. Now, the fourth day, God came back to the light and created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now, the fifth day, God came back to the same waters and created the moving creatures in the waters, which is the fishes. And then the sixth day, God came back to the earth and created the man, which is Adam, which is of the earth, Eti. So now, the trees themselves were also made in the sixth day. Understanding this, we realize that God is working by a principle of triangulation or in threes. We know that he worked with the light, he worked with the waters, and then he worked with the earth. Now, the lights correspond to Passover. The waters correspond to Pentecost. And the earth corresponds to Tabernacles. Very quickly, the light corresponds to Jesus, who is our Passover lamb. Then the waters correspond to the Holy Spirit, who came on the day of Pentecost. Then Tabernacle speaks of the Father who has come to Tabernacle amongst men in the revelation of Jesus, as we read the book of Revelation. So we realize that the creation account, when we begin to enter into Tabernacles and go into the fullness of Tabernacles, then we are seeing the seven days of God's creative works and His rest. And all these are the feast of the Lord. And all of these were the rehearsals that God was enacting from the beginning. And actually, the seven days of creation was God having a good time. That he was in his festive season and he was causing things to show up in the earth realm. These things are so important. Exactly. Why is it that we don't see much of these celebrations in the church today? I, I think that um, it's a matter of probably revelation, understanding. And then let's also say that a certain amount of ignorance or lack of understanding in these things. But anybody whose heart follows the Lord and would listen or would take time off to understand the feast cannot ignore the feast because the substance of the feast is Christ. And if a man will celebrate Christ, we are not talking about the outward motions of the feast, but understanding the reality of the feast. Like for instance, if you say you won't celebrate the feast, the word of God says that Christ our Passover. Yeah. So the Passover is actually Christ. Christ. If you say you won't celebrate the feast, does that mean you won't celebrate Christ? But if you will celebrate Christ, then you surely will celebrate the feast yeah. because Christ is our Passover, sure. you see. of it. Always a blessing. Wisdom. A subject that has befuddled many a believer 
and remains a mystery to most. Some have said it is the proper application of knowledge. Others have defined it as beautiful cascading and articulation of words. But did you know that wisdom is not learned in the schools of this world and that a believer must never ask for wisdom? Introducing a treasure that would revolutionize this generation and the next. The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, The Hidden Elixir of Life, a riveting book written by Pastor Obedobing Ade. In this book, you would come under the inspiration of the Holy Rock of God as the man of God, Pastor Obed, unlocks this mystery, which is wisdom. As you flip each page of this book, you will be built up into a glorious edifice, expressive in works and power. Order a copy of this book now, available in all our bookshops. To place an order, please call us on plus 233-20-910-5997 or on plus 233-55-792-6498. You can also get the ebook on Amazon's Kindle app or visit www.christgospelpolitan.org for more information. Shalom. Pastor Obed, always a blessing.